Well, this morning we return in our study of God's Word to the epistle of Hebrews. Uh, Lord willing, today we'll be finishing out chapter 11. So if you want to take your Bibles and turn there together with me, Hebrews chapter 11. We'll be looking this morning at verses 30 to 40. I've entitled today's message, again, very creatively, The Faith Hall of Fame, Part 4. In a very real sense... Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is one text, it's one message. Uh, There's one primary point that is being made, and that is that um, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen, and by faith men of old gained approval. And then the rest of the chapter is a series of illustrations from the Old Testament that demonstrate just that point. And he really walks, as we've seen over the last several weeks, he walks through Genesis 1 to 11, Genesis 12 to 50, Exodus. Today he's going to take us through Joshua and the rest of the Old Testament. And all of these are illustrations of faith at work by which God's people historically in the past, both in good times and in bad, both in triumphs and tragedies, Uh, both in manifest uh, uh, evidences of God's miraculous deliverance of His people uh, from um, a threat of life and limb and even resurrection, and times when God's people, which is the majority of the occasions, suffered and even died for their faith. And in all of this, they never got what God was promising. They were always looking forward to what God has in store for not just them, but for all of us in glory. Uh, just by way of, of a brief introduction, I remind you that this epistle that is written to the Hebrews is called Hebrews, or the epistle to the Hebrews, because it's written about 30 to 35 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is written to Jewish believers, encouraging them in a time of intense persecution, at the time of the Jewish revolt, encouraging Jewish believers in and around Jerusalem and Judea not to return to Judaism, but to hold fast to Christ. And he demonstrates the superiority of Christ by showing that he's superior to the Old Testament prophets, he's superior to angels, very significantly from a Jewish perspective, he is superior to Moses, not only to Moses, but to Aaron and the Aaronic priesthood, to the Old Testament sacrificial system, and to everything the Old Testament had because it pointed ultimately to him. And if you go back to an Old Testament sacrificial system now that has been made obsolete by the once for all perfect sacrifice for Christ, then you are rejecting what the whole Old Testament promised. You are rejecting everything that God promised in that Old Testament system. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 10, just to get a running start as our, at our final look at Hebrews 11, your author says, if you, if you go on sinning willfully, verse 26, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. If you, if you having been exposed to and made a commitment to the person of Jesus Christ, which is the fulfillment of all the things promised and pictured in the Old Testament, if you then reject Christ, the fulfillment of all of that, and go back to the Old Testament, then nothing awaits you but judgment. In verse 31, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Apart from the person and work of Jesus Christ and the once for all perfect sacrifice on the cross that he made for us to reconcile us to God. There is no way to stand before God. There is no reconciliation with God. Remember, the point that your author has made in those first ten chapters is that the the fact that the Old Testament sacrificial system by itself did not actually take away sins is proven by the very fact that all of the Aaronic priesthood, those guys had to keep uh, being replaced because they kept dying themselves. And every time they made sacrifices, the first thing they had to do was make a sacrifice for themselves and then offer one up for the people. And beyond that, 
The sacrifices continue to happen day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, generations after generations, demonstrating that none of those sacrifices took away sin. They just covered them in faith until Christ provided that once for all sacrifice. And when Christ came and died, he offered up himself as the punishment or as the uh, the satisfaction of the punishment for our sins so having seen that and having believed in that and having professed faith in Christ and come to him to turn back now is to turn back to what has been made obsolete by what was made complete in the person of Jesus Christ you're turning your back on everything the Old Testament pointed to you're not going back to an Old Testament system the way it was You're going back to what is obsolete. And it's an offense to God. In verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 10, your author says, Remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings. Again, remember, these are Jewish Christians in and around Jerusalem and Judea. Many of these would have been Christians that were saved those first uh, 10 or so years after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. These are some of these people, no doubt, among those who would have been saved even at the Apostle Peter's preaching on the steps on the temple in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. These are Jewish believers who would have been a part of that early church in Jerusalem. Perhaps even some of them still around who had endured the persecution of Saul and been driven out of town. He says, remember the former days when after being enlightened. In other words, when you first came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Remember how you endured a great conflict of sufferings. Partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations. And partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. Remember what it cost you to first identify with Jesus Christ. Remember how you were ostracized from society. And remember how you were selling possessions in order to meet the practical needs of one another. Remember Acts 2. Remember the behavior of the early church at the dawn of the church age? Remember how they sacrificed? They would sell, none of them considered anything they owned as just their own. They would sell possessions. Even Barnabas sold a plot of land and just gave the proceeds uh, to the church to meet the needs of the practical needs of the people in the church. That's what your author is stressing. Remember what it was like when you first came to saving faith in Jesus Christ, when you first became a believer and joined the church. Verse 34, you showed sympathy to the prisoners. You accepted joyfully even the seizure of your own property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Well, what is that better possession and how is it lasting? It's all the eternal glory. It's the possession of Jesus Christ. It's that place in the Father's house. It's everything that God has in store for us, not in this life, but in the next. He says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance. You could even translate that, indeed, you have need of endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and he will not delay. And here is the point that is being made by all of Hebrews chapter 11. It's a quote from Habakkuk 2. By, but my righteous one shall live by what? Faith. My righteous one. The one who is justified uh, in my sight. The one who has been reconciled to me and is in a right relationship with me. My righteous one will live by faith. We are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith to the persevering of the soul. And then that's when the question is asked in Hebrews 11.1, well, what is faith? And here's the answer. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And by faith, living by faith, being one of God's righteous ones, living by faith, you gain approval. Approval with whom? With God. By it, by faith, the men of old gained approval. And notice that he starts in Genesis 1. By faith, we understand. The worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen is not made out of things which are visible. I find it amazing and fascinating 
that the very foundation of society's attack on Scripture begins on the very first page today, believing in evolution, billions of years, and all of that nonsense, with no evidence to prove it. You say, well, you don't have evidence either. Well, I technically do have evidence. I have the Scriptures. I have the God who created everything out of nothing telling me He did it, and I'm, I choose to believe His Word. You have scientific theory, which no doubt in 50 or 100 years will again be disproved and revised. I have the unchanging eternal word. I have the God himself who did it, telling me what he did. And you know what faith is? Faith takes God at his word, and it starts taking him at his word on the very first page. And from that point on, your author begins to walk through the Old Testament, just pulling out highlights. He didn't even pull all of them out. He doesn't even focus on necessarily always the biggest event that we would pick if we were to highlight people of faith and the demonstrations of faith in their lives. But he is pulling out some heavy hitters. In verse 4, he says, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. Verse 5, By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. Verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark. And having completed the patriarchal period, or excuse me, the primeval period, the initial period of human history, uh, in, that, in that first 11 chapters of Genesis, he moves to Genesis 12 to 50. And he pulls out Abraham in verse 8. And he mentions uh, Sarah in verse 11. And he says in verse 13, all of these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Because those who say such things make it clear they're seeking a country of their own. They're looking forward to a city, an eternal inheritance, a place to live that is the Father's house. It's a city whose maker and builder is God. They live this life in faith, trusting God, not looking to see all those promises fulfilled in this life, but looking forward with confidence in God to seeing them and believing they had evidence uh, from the Word of God and from the life that they lived for God. They had evidences enough to base their eternity on them. And they lived in light of God's promises, looking forward to an eternal heavenly future. Verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Verse 20, by faith Isaac, blessed Jacob and Esau. Verse 21, by faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph. Then by faith Joseph, verse 22, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. Now, I just walked through the highlights of all of Genesis 1 through 50 there. Starting with Abel, well, starting with creation, Abel, Enoch, and Noah. And then he went through Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And that brings us to Exodus and the faith of Moses. And actually, it's not even Moses' faith on display to begin with, it's his parents. Verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And so they were not afraid of the king's edict. And then by faith Moses himself, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking to the reward. See, again, the same principle. The people of faith, whether you're talking about Abel and Enoch and Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, or Joseph, or whether you're talking about Moses or anybody else in the Old Testament. They believed God. They trust God. They were willing to identify with God and His people no matter what it cost them in this life. Why? Because they were looking forward to not this life the way they want. They were looking forward to what God has in store for all of us together. They have mention of the Passover uh, in the Exodus in verse 27. The Passover in verse 28. The parting of the Red Sea in verse 29. And that completes, essentially, the Pentateuch. You say, well, 
What about Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? We'll talk about that in a minute. When we get into today's text now, we see what I'll just refer to as the final wave of illustrations. And we're going to break it into two pieces. We have the illustrations of faith from Joshua, verses 30 and 31. And then we have the illustrations of faith from the rest of the Old Testament, verses 32 to 40. So when I say from Joshua, I mean the book of Joshua. And then the rest of the Old Testament is from Judges all the way through the rest of the Old Testament. And it's really interesting to see what your author is going to do here by the time he gets to verse 32 when he kind of just throws his hands up and say, I'm going to run out of ink if I do this, even in the summary way I'm doing it. So let me just hit even at the highest level. Well, let's just group some of the manifestations of faith. We start first with the illustrations of faith from the book of Joshua. There are two of them that he points out in particular. The first is the conquest of Jericho, and the second is the preservation of Rahab. Verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. We've gone past the narrative of Exodus, and we skip the whole of that 40-year wilderness wandering. And we go straight to the conquest. Moses has died. Uh, they've conquered everything on the eastern side of the Jordan, and they're about to cross over the Jordan and take over the promised land that God has promised them. And the first place they take is Jericho, a walled city, a stronghold. You say, well, why did, why did the author skip over Leviticus through Deuteronomy? I think the answer is, very clearly, in Hebrews 3 and 4, he used that whole wilderness wandering period as a negative illustration. If you look back at Hebrews 3 in particular, we'll just jump into the middle, I'll just demonstrate this to you. In Hebrews 3 and verse 12, when talking about the superiority of Christ to Moses uh, and uh, uh, the, the warnings of defection and, and disobedience and grumbling and complaining, he says uh, in Hebrews 3.12, Take care, brethren, that that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Instead, encourage each other day by day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm all the way to the end. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, Uh, as when they provoked me, referring to the wilderness wandering in Numbers. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was God angry for 40 years? Was it not those same people who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would not enter his rest? It was to those who were disobedient, was it not? So we see they were not able to enter because of unbelief. So when you look at the wilderness wandering event, you say, well, wait a minute. What about Joshua and Caleb? And Moses, except for one offense, was faithful, right? Yes. But the primary stress of that whole time frame in redemptive history, your author has used it as an illustration, not of belief, but of unbelief. Not of faith, but unfaith or unfaithfulness. So when it comes to the Faith Hall of Fame, he skips that and goes straight to Joshua, straight to the conquest of the land. And he begins in Hebrews 11, verse 30, by saying, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Now, if you keep your finger here in Hebrews 11 and jump back into the Old Testament to Joshua with me for just a moment... Let me illustrate this for you right from the text. This is Joshua chapter 6. Joshua 6. Now some of you folks are uh, academy graduates, is that right? Military academy graduates. This is probably not amongst the normal strategic or even tactical approaches to conquering an enemy city that you've studied. And yet it has worked it worked better than any conquest in history. Now let me dem- demonstrate to you how it happened. 
Joshua 6, verse 1, Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. So the Israelites are coming across the Jordan River. They wait a little while after the circumcision, and then they're ready to go and take over the land. Well, the people of the land know they're coming. And so they shut the gates and they close everything up. Tightly shut up because the Israelites, no one goes out, no one comes in. The Lord says to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and the valiant warriors. And here, is, here are your marching orders. So you can just picture the whiteboard or I guess on the, on the big screen, the HDMI screens or whatever, the, the arrows with the highlights and the circles and all that stuff, step by step of the marching order. This is where we're going to take over the city. You ready? You're going to march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once and do that every day for six days. So we're going to take the army. We're going to get up early in the morning. We're going to march around the city. And then we're going to sit down and we're going to wait. And we're going to do it again the next day. Six days in a row. That's what you're going to do. And by the way, also seven priests are going to carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. So you're going to, you're going to have this little, this little priestly procession that goes with the army. And they're going to have horns. And on the seventh day, you're going to march around the city, not once, but seven times. And then the priests blow the trumpets. And it shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all of the people, the whole host, the whole army, is going to shout with a great shout. Ah! And the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up every man straight ahead. And that's how you're going to take the city. Can you see a general out at Edwards or NORAD or wherever sitting down and drawing that up? We're going to do what? We're just going to go fly around the city and then go back and land. And then go fly around the city and then go back and land. And the seventh day, we're going to fly around seven times and then blow a horn and everybody go, ah, and, and we're going to win. That's it. Doesn't it, seem, doesn't it seem kind of silly? Yes. Yes. You, you want to know why? Because it isn't going to be any, uh, any cavalry, it isn't going to be any archery, it isn't going to be any uh, spears or swords or axes, or it's not going to be the military might that, that takes that first strong city. It's going to be who? God. You want know the test is here to Joshua and to the nation of Israel? God says, here's how you're going. And by the way, they conquered the eastern, to the eastern side of the Jordan with normal military fight. Now, there was one time when... Moses' arms are up, and they're winning. Moses gets tired, and his arms come down. What happens? They start losing. Moses goes, oh, we're losing. I've got to get my arms up again because, oh, God, please give us victory. And as long as Moses aren't... Moses is an old guy. Moses is 120 years old at the time. You see, you think I'm old. Moses is twice my age. He's holding his arms up. When he can't do it anymore, they get some young bucks holding his arms up. Can you see this old guy? Yeah, hold him up. Oh, I can't feel my fingers. Well, was it really Moses' arms being up or was it that that demonstrated they really are dependent upon God to give them victory? It's faith. It's, a, it's an objective demonstration of faith. Was there any magic to Moses' arms or to his arms being up? No, but, but them helping Moses hold his arms up demonstrated they were dependent on God to, to be successful, to overcome their enemies. Well, this particular conquest is, is aimed at accomplishing that same thing, recognizing that the one who is going to give you uh, victory over Jericho, the one who's going to be with you for the whole conquest, the one upon whom you're, you're dependent for the whole of your lives and the whole of your existence, not just the conquest, but for the whole of your existence, is God. So, Joshua believes God and does exactly as God told him. Verse 6, Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, let seven priests carry seven trumpets, just like was instructed. Verse 7, he says to the people, Go forward, march around the city, let the armed men go on before the Ark of the Lord. So the, the army, the Ark, the priests with the trumpets, the, you know, so the army, the Ark, and the band. And that's what we're going to do. And it was so. 
When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram horns before the Lord went forward, they blew the trumpets, and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the Ark while they continued to blow the trumpets. Joshua commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor let your voice be heard, nor let a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I tell you. Shout, and then you will shout. So he had the ark of the Lord taken around the city, circling it once, and then they came into the camp, spent the night in the camp. So that's our morning attack. March around the city. A little band in the back. We're done. We sit down and we camp out. Joshua rose early in the morning. Priests took up the ark of the Lord. Seven priests carrying the seven trunks, just like before. And the armed men went before. The rear guard came after the ark. They continued to blow the trumpets. Thus, the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp, and they did the same thing for six days. Why? Because that's what God said. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of the... By the way, can you imagine being in the city? What are they doing? Can you imagine the anxiety building and everything else? On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawning of the day. They marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only that day, they marched around the city city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, that's when Joshua said to the people, Shout, because the Lord has given you the city. The city shall be under the ban. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who are with her in the house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But as for you, only keep yourselves from the things under the ban so that you do not covet them and take some of the things under the ban. Make the camp of Israel accursed and bring trouble on it if you do it. But all the silver and gold, the articles of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people did just like Moses or just like Joshua said. They shouted. The priests blew the trumpets. When the people heard the sound of the trumpet, they shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. I, I read in commentaries this week, somebody, some were talking about, was it, was it you know, the combination of the sound waves from the trumpets? and the Seriously? No, it was the quivering of the knees on the wall that actually caused the walls to fall flat. Was there anything magical, mystical, or sound wave related that facilitated the destruction of that city? No. It was God who just dropped the walls. It's a miracle. It's exactly what happened. Why did God do it this way? To teach Joshua and that whole generation and to be an illustration for all generations thereafter, and to be an illustration even able to be used in Hebrews 11 for Jewish believers considering going back to Judaism in the first century, and by way of application even for us, to learn that God can accomplish His purposes without any help from us. And God can give us victory over any obstacle when we trust Him and obey Him. Success is dependent upon the Lord, not the sword. So you go to verse 20. The people shouted. Priests blew the trumpets. People heard the sound of the trumpet. They shouted. People went up into the city. Every man straight ahead. They took the city. They utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. And Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the harlot's house and bring the woman and all she has out of there as you have sworn to her. And so the young men who were spies went in, brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all she had. They also brought out all of her relatives and placed them outside the camp of Israel. So they spared her life and set set the whole family outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and all that was in it. Only the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all she had, Joshua spared, and she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day. Why? Because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. And Joshua curses the city. It's leveled total victory. And how did they gain total victory? By force of arms? By faith. 
And that's the illustration that your author is seeking to draw for you in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. They just did what God said for seven days, and he gave them total victory. You know, this is the only time God does it this way. For all the rest of them, there's actually military conquests and And in some respects, even military academies, even in Israel to this day, study the rest of the conquest and the strategies and some of the faint maneuvers, etc., that God orchestrates. uh, uh, The very practical ways in which God gave success after this one. But why do this one this way? To teach from the very beginning your success or failure will be dependent upon not your force of arms, but your faith in God. Now you go to Hebrews 11, verse 31, and you'll notice the second illustration makes reference to what we just talked about. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. It's interesting, this actually refers not to Joshua 6, but this takes us back to Joshua 2. So if you want to take your Bibles and go back to Joshua 2. Let me just show you the faith of Rahab that resulted in her not perishing along with all the rest of the Canaanites who were destroyed in the city of Jericho. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with the rest of those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Joshua 2.1 Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. Remember that Moses sent spies in the land as well. He took representatives from each of the twelve tribes, and he did it all publicly. Joshua has learned from that, and he picks two men himself and sends them secretly. Nobody knows about this, and you guys are not going to be reporting to the world. You're going to report to me. And you're going to go spy out Jericho because that's the instructions God has given as far as the first place we're going. So I just want to know the lay of the land. So they go in to find out about Jericho. So they went and they came into the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab and lodged there. The word harlot, both in Hebrew and in Hebrews 11 in Greek, in both cases, translated a harlot, literally refers to a professional fornicator. Historically, both ancient rabbinic commentators as well as early church fathers sought to soften this idea by translating it as something like an innkeeper. Okay, it's not an innkeeper. And yes, it is a shameful lifestyle that God saved her from. But that's not unlike anything else you will read in the rest of the New Testament where Paul talks about those who were drunkards, those who were swindlers, those who were cheats, those who were murderers and adulterers and effeminate and homosexuals, etc. And such were some of you. Listen, she was a harlot, a professional fornicator. She made her living sinning. Well, why would God save her? Why would God save Matthew, the tax collector? Why would God save me? Why would God save you? Because we're all sinners. Well, it was told the king of Jericho, verse 2, Behold, the, the men of the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. We have spies in our midst. So the king sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. Turn over the spies. But the woman uh, had taken the two men and hidden them. So she's got them on the roof uh, underneath the flax that's laid out to dry. She says, Yes, the men came to me, but I didn't know where they were from. And it came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark, Uh, The men went out. I don't know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid out in order on the roof, normal way for uh, drying out flax. So these are big uh, 
uh, kind of like uh, bamboo-like slat things that are to just, you know, it's like your garage. You could easily hide two spies probably in, mo- well, Bob, we could hide about 40 in yours, right? But, uh, but you, you follow what I'm saying? That's, she hit him on the roof. Verse 7, so the men pursued them on the road to the Jordan fords. And as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. So now the city's all locked up. And before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof. She says to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land. And I know that the terror of you has fallen upon all of us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. We all know about you and we all know about your God. We have heard how, notice that it's Lord in all capital letters in most of your Bibles. That means it's actually the covenant name for God that she uses right here, Yahweh. We have heard how Yahweh, that's a way to address God as the God of Israel in a personal relationship. We have heard how Yahweh dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. You know, when she says this, that was 40 years ago. We heard how Yahweh parted the Red Sea, delivered you from the Egyptians, and then wiped them out. And we heard what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Those are the two kingdoms on the eastern side of the Jordan that Moses just led in success, and they just wiped them all out. We've heard about how your God and how he's with you and how he beat the Egyptians and how he beat those kingdoms on the eastern side of the Jordan, and we heard how he's with you. When we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in anyone any longer because of you. Which, by the way, as a footnote here, if you're familiar with the grumbling and complaining of Israel after they were delivered from bondage in Egypt and the Red Sea, and they got to the edge of the promised land and the 12 spies go in and they look at everything. Oh, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, but there are giants in the land. They're afraid to go in. God had already put a terror on the people in there. They were afraid of their God. They weren't afraid of the Israelites. They were afraid of the Israelites' God. And the Israelites failed to trust their God. It's interesting, isn't it? Anyways, we heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. We heard how you wiped out Sihon and Og and utterly destroyed them. And when we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in anyone any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Notice her profession of faith in their God. Yeah, she's a prostitute. Yeah, she's a Canaanite. And yes, God forgives her and grants her a place in His people. And even, if you read Matthew's Gospel, you will see she has a place even in the Messianic line. She's a greater grandmother of David and a greater grandmother ultimately then of Christ as well. Therefore, please swear to me by the Lord. Give me your word in the name of Yahweh, your God, since I've dealt kindly with you, that you also will deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth. Spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, with all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. My life and my existence and the existence of my family is dependent upon your mercy and the mercy of your God. Please, I've hidden you. Please preserve me. So they say to her, our life for yours. If you don't tell this business of ours, it shall come about when Yahweh gives the land that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. So she let them down by a rope through the window from her house because it was on the wall, which means when the walls fell flat, obviously her house didn't collapse, right? So the walls, you just hit a picture, one wall goes flat and they go in. She let them down by a rope through the window. And she says to them, go to the hill country so the pursuers will not happen upon you and hide yourselves there for three days until they come back and then afterward go your way. And the men said to her, we shall be free from this oath to which we have, uh, which you have made us swear unless when we come into this land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down. 
And gather to yourself into the house your father, your mother, your brothers, and all of your father's household. Everybody you want spared, including yourself, needs to be in, this, in your house. And you need to have this thread visible outside the wall, the window that you have in the wall, so that we can see that you are there and still identify yourself with us which puts her at risk because she's identifying herself then with the people of Israel while she's still living inside. It shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be free. But anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on his head if a hand is laid upon him. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be free from the oath which we have, uh, you have made us swear." And she said, according to your words, so be it. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied that scarlet cord in the window and left it there. Do you want to know why she was preserved? Because even while she was still in the city, she identified herself willingly and freely by faith with the God of Israel. Now you go back to Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 30 and 31. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. God gave victory in that first step of conquest in the land once they crossed the Jordan, not by military arms, but by faith in God. And the way that he facilitated it was making them do something that demonstrated they were going to do what he said, no matter how silly it sounded. Verse 31, by faith Rahab, the harlot, didn't perish along with those who were disobedient. Not because she wasn't disobedient, not because she wasn't a sinner, not because she wasn't a Canaanite, not because she wasn't a harlot, but because she had welcomed the spies in peace or peace, peaceably and identified herself freely and willingly by faith with them and with their God. Again, I take you back to the beginning. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen, and this is how you gain approval. I take you back to the end of Hebrews 10. The just shall live by what? Faith. And this is what it looks like. This is what it looked like for Joshua and the nation of Israel, taking God at his word and marching around and shouting as though that's going to do anything. Well, it didn't. But their obedience, their obedience... Uh, is what God uh, required in order to act on their behalf. And likewise for Rahab. She wasn't saved by uh, anything special throughout all of redemptive history. From the beginning to the end of Scripture, what you have as illustrations in the Scriptures is illustrations of what it takes to be uh, in a place where you gain the approval of God as His people. And that is you have to be people of faith, people who live by faith. What more shall I say? Time will fail me if I tell of, notice, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Uh, He doesn't even name all of the judges. He doesn't name any of the kings except for David. He names Samuel the last of the judges. And then when it comes to Daniel, and Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah, and Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Elisha, and Elijah, and Zechariah, and Habakkuk, and all the rest. Gideon. You can read about him in Judges 6 to 9. He's a really interesting character. His standing for God begins when he smashes an altar of Baal. But he does it at night, so nobody can see him. Then in the morning, the people notice, hey, someone beat up our God and smashed it. Oh, it's Gideon. So they go to his dad's house, and they knock on the door. Hey, your son smashed the altar of Baal. (laughs) Your your son was out at night and and vandalizing things. And, And you know, I love his dad. Well, you know, Baal's supposed to be a god, right? Well, if he's really a god, let him deal with it. And go back to work. And you know what happens to Gideon? Nothing. You know what happens to the altar? Nothing, because Baal's just a stick. Okay? 
We get to the place where God tells Gideon that he's going to be used by God to deliver Israel from the Midianites. You know, Midian needs to use a fleece. Uh, God, how do I know you're going to be with me? I'll tell you what I'm going to do, God, so that I know that you're with me. I'm going to take a rug. I'm going to set it out. And if it's wet in the morning, then I'll know you're with me. So he sets it out. And it's wet in the morning. Okay, God. Just, just to be clear here, I'm going to set it out again tomorrow morning, and if it's dry, then I'll know you're going to be with me. You know, you know how the weather is. Maybe I guessed wrong. So he puts it out, guess what? It's dry the next day. Not exactly a man of great faith, is he? And yet, when you read the end of the account, what you will see is that Gideon puts together this great host, and God says, you know what, you got too many guys. You're going after thousands, and you're trying to put together thousands. I need to pare you down to just the guys that drink left-handed in a certain way. So he gets it down to 300 guys. Gideon and 300 guys take out thousands of Midianites by breaking pitchers. Not, not, not pictures, pitchers, okay? Just smashing them and blowing trumpets and then everybody in the camp, ah, we're being attacked and they kill each other. That's just a demonstration of how God works through the faith of his people to do things that his people couldn't do on their own. Barak, another stellar demonstration of a tremendous manhood. Deborah is a prophet and says, you need to go, you need to take on Sisera and his chariots and the Canaanites. And he says, I'll go if you go. <laughs> you, okay, but you know, if I go, then you're not going to get to be the hero and take out the opposing. I don't care. I'm not going without you. Okay, I'll go. But there's, it, it, what's really amazing is as you go through the Old Testament history, these heroes of the faith, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, these guys are far from ideal candidates for elders. Do you, you, you follow what I'm saying? Samson was under a Nazarite vow from birth, and God is with him through immorality. God is with him uh, through partying and drunkenness. Uh, and finally God leaves him when he gives away the final step of his Nazarite vow, which is cutting the hair. He's humbled, he gets uh, uh, his eyes put out, and he gets mocked and ridiculed, and finally at the end of his life, in what is perhaps the greatest demonstration of God's faithfulness, when Samson repents in Judges 16 and says, God, have mercy on me, and give me strength again to take out uh, these Philistine judges. Why mention guys like Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah? Because even in their imperfect faith, God blessed them and used them. Even despite their great foolishness, failures, and shortcomings, God used them bless them, save them, and has glory in store for them. It brings us to the next two names, David and Samuel. I, I think David is probably the most encouraging person to study in the Bible as a believer because David covers the whole gamut. David is, from the beginning, identified as a man after what? God's own heart. And David, as a man after God's own heart, with an intimate personal relationship with God, having been elevated to the place of being king over all Israel, sins royally as king by taking Bathsheba, another man's wife, for himself. And when he gets her pregnant covering it up, or at least seeking to cover it up, and having failed to do that, conspires to have her husband murdered. 
David is an adulterer and a murderer. And he lives the rest of his life with the shame of that. And, and if you're attentive to 2 Samuel chapters 12 through 24, you will see that even his dealings with Absalom and all that comes about after that, there is a tie, all of it, there's a tie right back to his sin with Bathsheba and his shame. How can he, how can he do, uh, make a righteous judgment against one of his sons that's done something that's terrible, but yet no different than he's done? And yet David is a man of faith. Samuel is a man of faith. In fact, you've got a list. This is a, a summary list of the type of things that God's people have accomplished by faith in the past. These are those who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness. Conquering kingdoms means just that. Military victories, the conquest of lands and kingdoms and cities. Performing righteousness or doing acts of righteousness means, means doing things that are absolutely right by God's standard. Obtained promises, saw the fulfillment of God's promises and the answers to prayers. Shut the mouths of lions. It's hard not to immediately go to Daniel 6 and think of Daniel with this. You remember Daniel was thrown into the lion's den? And he's there all night long. And the lions are not, typically those lions are not fed for a week. And then they throw a human being in there. So he spent the whole night in a lion's den with lions who haven't eaten for a week. No harm comes to Daniel. So they lift Daniel out. And they take his accusers and throw him in. And the Bible tells us before they hit the ground, the beasts tore them to shreds. Clear demonstration uh, by a divine providence uh, and I think a, a miraculous demonstration there vindicating Daniel in his integrity. But frankly, David himself uh, in 1 Samuel 17, when he's getting ready to go out and face Goliath and everybody's afraid, you're just a youth, you're just a teenager, man. You can't go out against the giant. And David's like, you know what? That dirty Philistine is mocking the God of Israel. Somebody's got to go out and take him out. I can go. God will be with me. Well, you, can't, you can't go out there against him. You're just a kid. You know what? God has already enabled me to overcome both the lion and the bear. Means he's had to battle a lion to protect the flock and a bear to protect the flock. They've quenched the power of fire. I think this is uh, uh, probably also a reference back to Daniel's day, but it's a reference to uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You probably know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are guys, I, I can't help but turn here. T look at Daniel 3 with me. This is a marvelous manifestation of what faith looks like. I think this is one of the high points of the Old Testament, perhaps even higher than Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar sets up a, an image of himself, being encouraged by all the rest of the, his high-ranking muckety-mucks around him. You, you're so great, king, you ought to be worshipped as a god. Let's make an image of you and set it up and everybody can bow down and worship. Oh, that sounds just dandy. So he does it. Well, there's three guys there who won't bow down. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They won't bow down. Oh, and, and the, the rest of the leaders expected this, so they point him out right away. King, there's these three guys. They won't bow down. So he brings him forward, and, he, and we're told in verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar's in a, in a rage and anger, and he gives orders to have those three brought to him. So they come to him, and he says, Is it true? that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up. Now, if you're ready at the moment that you hear the sound of the horn, I'm going to give you another chance. So we're going to play, the band's going to play all these kinds of music. If you're ready at that point, fall down and worship the image that I've made. Well, very good. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? 
Nobody's going to save you from this. You need to bow down or I'm going to have you cast in a fire. And he's madder than spit. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer concerning this matter. In other words, we don't have to think about it. I, I don't need time to think. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. Uh, it, our God is able to rescue us f- from that fire. Notice, he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Ultimately, you don't have control over us. He does. But even if he does not, I love this. Even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now that's faith, right there. I know God can save me from that fiery furnace. And I know ultimately he will deliver me from you. But even if he doesn't save me from the fiery furnace and this costs me my life, I am not bowing down to your God, so feel free to throw me in. And if you follow through the rest of the narrative, and we're not going to take time, but if you follow through the rest of the narrative, you know what you'll see? The guys that threw those three guys in, they died because it was so hot just getting them in there to push them in. Superheated. And those three guys standing in there and the angel of the Lord shows up and they have a little chat in the fiery furnace and finally the king, uh, fearful, has to say, uh, guys, can you come out so we can chat? Did God save those three from the fiery furnace? Yes. You know what real faith is though? Even if he, do- I know he can save me, but even if he doesn't, it doesn't matter. I love him, I trust him. He will deliver me ultimately from you. See, they're looking for a city whose maker and builder is who? See, that's the point that's being made all the way through here. And he could have gone and looked at all of these texts with us. And instead, if you go back to Hebrews 11, we just rifle through the end of the chapter. This is it. Time will fail me if I tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets. And and, and let me just summarize all these guys. By faith, they conquered kingdoms. By faith, they performed acts of righteousness. By faith, they obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the, the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war. They put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. There are two immediate illustrations of resurrection in the Old Testament. The first is Elijah and the widow at Zarephath. You can look at this in 1 Kings 17. And the second is Elisha and the Shunammite son. In both cases, God, through his prophet, either Elijah or Elisha, raised a young man man back to life. Now, he died again, just like Lazarus died again, just like the widow's son that Jesus raised died again. But God demonstrated in these sprinkled resurrection accounts through the Bible that he has the power over life and death. Women receive back their dead by resurrection. There have been times when God has personally intervened and resurrected somebody from the dead. But you know what most of God's people have faced? The same thing you are facing, Hebrews. Others were, verse 35, tortured not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. Not just being brought back to this life, only to die again. They were looking forward to, the, uh, to a glorious future, to a better resurrection. Still others experienced mockings and scourgings. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. You could translate that even. Yes, even chains and imprisonment for being God's people, for having faith in God. Now, it may seem like this is pretty far from us, but I dare say last year, a pastor in Canada that I know was one of my students was imprisoned for opening the church. And I doubt we are terribly far from that here. They were stoned, verse 37. They were sawn in two. There were numerous occasions of people. I mean, you only have to go to the Old Testament to see somebody stoned for their faith. Stephen is stoned for his faith in Jesus Christ and testimony to him in Acts chapter 7. Zechariah the priest is stoned for speaking for God in 2 Chronicles 24. Typically, stoning is reserved for those who are recognized as false prophets. And in both of those cases, it was somebody who was speaking the truth of God. So, 
put to death as though speaking against God when in reality you're speaking for God. It is easy to be misunderstood in this world. It is easy to be misrepresented in this world. It is easy to be mocked and ridiculed and punished in this world for being one of God's people. See, the point that he's getting to here is, you Jewish believers, you're under duress, and you're thinking about defecting from Christ and going back to Judaism, which is now obsolete, because it will be better. I'm here to tell you, you will offend the God who saved you. You will estrange yourself from the one true God and the only means of reconciliation to him, and you are abandoning the whole heritage of faith that begins in Genesis 1 and goes through the whole Old Testament and, frankly, all the way to glory. Identifying yourself with God means identifying yourself by faith with him to the point where you're willing to suffer the loss of anything and everything in order to be identified with him. They were tempted. They were put to death with a sword. They went about, and by the way, at this point, Paul has probably been put to death with a sword. And Peter has probably been crucified. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins. Uh, some writers have suggested that this is some kind of uh, prophetic garb because that's the way John the Baptist dressed. But I think if you look at the next expression, it tells you that this just means that they were dressed uh, they, don't, they don't have a lot of possessions. They didn't dress in clothes, fancy clothes or fine clothes or even common clothes. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins. Why? Being what? What's the next word? Destitute, in poverty, afflicted, ill-treated. People of whom the world was not what? Worthy. Wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Strangers and ostracized from society. Listen, this is what it means to be a believer. This is what it means to be a Christian, to be identified as one of God's people. The world will hate you. Jesus promised this, did he not? Blessed are you when and persecute you and revile you and say all manner of evil against you for my sake. And what's he say? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Seems like exactly the opposite type of reaction that I would normally have. Well, why would I do that? Because so they persecuted the prophets who were before you, and great is your reward in heaven. You look at Hebrews 11. Is that not the point of Hebrews 11? Live in light of the glories that God has in store for us. Notice we come to the conclusion of the whole chapter in verses 39 and 40. All of these having gained approval. Approval with whom? With God. Through their faith. Did not receive what was promised. Many of them were martyred. Many of them died. They were, they were executed by the sword. They were stoned. They were burned. They were sawn in two. They died for their faith. They didn't get the promises that God has uh, in store for us. Why? Because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Do you know what our ultimate promise is? Our ultimate promise is that we not only will live in a new creation, we will be perfected as God's people and we will never sin against him. We will be in an, infant, uh, an intimate, personal relationship with him perfected forever. And we will reside in the new Jerusalem, the father's house in perfect communion and fellowship forever. The Old Testament saints lived lives of faith. The Old Testament saints were not perfect. None of them were. Even the ones that don't have specific offenses against God recorded. The heroes of the faith in the Old Testament ultimately are broken, sinful people just like you and me. What, what facilitated them gaining approval with God was their faith in Him and their commitment to identify with Him and be identified with Him as His people no matter what it cost them. And that's the lesson. That's the strength of the argument that your author is seeking to build here. That's why 
he's going to start chapter 12 by saying, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's lay aside everything that holds us back, including the sin that so easily entangles us and instead run with endurance the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. See, they were looking forward to what God promised in the person of Jesus Christ. We have seen him. We look back and see what he has done. And since we have this whole host of witnesses of what faith looks like before Christ came and demonstrated how God was going to fulfill all of his promises, well, we have that. So instead of being those who waver, we ought to all the more be those who hold fast to him and live for him. Amen? Father, thank you so much for this day, for sending your son to die for us, for your incredible patience and grace that's on display in the lives of all of these Old Testament saints that we have barely brushed the surface of. Thank you for your word that continues to direct our attention back to the greatness of your person and work on the cross. Thank you for your spirit that convicts us and empowers us to live a life of faith in obedience to you. And for each of us in our homes, in our communities, in this church, and in our workplaces, may you indeed encourage us, empower us, and embolden us to be people who live visibly, publicly, as people committed to you and to your gospel so that others might see our good deeds and glorify you, our Father who is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.